afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the GRIPS Forum. My name is Narushige Michita. I teach International Security Affairs at the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies, or GRIPS, based in Tokyo. I'll be serving as your host today. In January last year, the United Kingdom left the European Union in what was called Brexit. We are now seeing positive and negative results arising from it. On the positive side, the United Kingdom can now formulate its foreign policy and economic policy much more flexibly. On the negative side, the country has become somewhat isolated in Europe. As a consequence of these new developments, the United Kingdom is taking steps to engage more deeply with Asia. It has de decided to deploy Her Majesty's ship, Queen Elizabeth, to the Pacific. It has also expressed its interest in participating in the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP-11. What has happened and what will happen next? What will Britain's increased engagement with Asia bring about? Today, we have invited His Excellency, Mr. Koji Tsuroka, former ambassador of Japan to the United Kingdom to answer those questions. Ambassador Tsuroka served as the Japanese ambassador to the United Kingdom between 2016 and 2019. Prior to this appointment, he was the chief negotiator for the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP. Ambassador Tsuroka has served in Japanese embassies in Moscow, Washington, D.C., and Jakarta. I will ask Ambassador Tsuroka to speak for about 45 minutes, and we will open the screen for Q&A and discussion after that. The presentation and discussion in this session will be on the record. Ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome Ambassador Tsuroka. Good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you all very much for joining uh, this uh, <clears throat> webinar. And thank you, Professor uh, Michishita, for a very kind introduction. Uh, I am Koji Tsuruoka, uh, formerly uh, Ambassador of Japan to the United Kingdom from uh, June 2016 till end of November 2019. My term uh, was just over uh, three years, three years and about five months, and it was not a very typical ambassadorship uh, in London experienced by my predecessors, I had encountered three British prime ministers during these three and years and five months, which is quite a irregular, extraordinary, conflicting domestic political situation you are not expected to experience while serving in UK. Today, uh, I am uh, going to revisit the issue of Brexit, but not just to go through and relearn the history of Brexit, but with the aim of using Brexit as one example of a democratic decision making. Let me uh, turn to the slides that I have uh, prepared for this uh, seminar and hope uh, it will be uh, interesting and informative, but more than anything else, lead you to think uh, what we need to learn from uh, this experience. So two major issues I've uh, put up. One is why. 
Why did UK leave EU? The second is, and after departure, where is UK going? Now, the decision by the people, uh, which was uh, reflected in the referendum of June 2016, was based on a number of uh, uh, points that uh, I have indicated here. The real reason that I believe led to, first of all, holding of the referendum was a divided Conservative Party. The Conservatives have had different views on how they should address Europe. You will all recall in history, UK is, a pr is being proud of being not part of the continental Europe, but a important partner in the Atlantic Alliance, which means an indispensable bridge between continental Europe and Northern America, particularly United States. Sometimes it was called glorious isolation from the meddling politics of Europe. Third, there was a lot of confidence in UK, especially among the older generation or the elitist gen uh, classes that UK can go it alone. EU is not necessarily important in terms of maintaining prosperity or political stability of UK. Domestically, I think there were additional reasons. There was expanding disparity among classes and regions. This is uh, the negative effect of globalization, which is not unique in UK, but it's seen globally. There was also, and this was also caused, or even exacerbated in a way, by the austerity policy which David Cameron's government had pursued over the course of a little less than 10 years. This was reflected in deterioration of health services or even police and therefore crime rate rising in urban area. The economy was doing rather well and it was absorbing quite a number of uh, migrant workers, uh, many of them who came from Eastern Europe as part of being a group of European Union. The attraction of, of UK as a working place was, of course, uh, proven by the successful growing economy. So the overall economy in itself, I do not think, was in danger or even the cause of complaints or conflict within UK. It was more the disparity element which was exacerbated by the austerity policy that I believe people were becoming fed up. This last point, I think this is something that we need to keep our mind on. And in short, you could say propaganda. In other words, you don't have to really be factual when you are asserting your position. The question is how penetrating your message can be. And the Brexiteers were indeed very, very skillful in doing this. The British domestic politics during these years uh, were not very effective and people were not content with what they saw. One reason for having three prime ministers in three years. The Conservative Party continued to be divided even after 
Cameron's exit and the appointment of Theresa May as the Prime Minister. She was chosen to be Prime Minister by the Conservative Party and she had not experienced general election. So when opinion poll were indicating that the Conservative Party would surely experience a major win if an election is called, she was in a way convinced by the party leaders to hold the general election, which was done in June 2017. It turned out to be a failure from Theresa May's viewpoint because she lost the majority which the Cameron's government had obtained in the previous general election. She was forced to form a coalition with a party in Northern Ireland, which held 10 seats. Beyond that, she was irresponsible to deliver what the referendum had asked. Simply, just do Brexit. But of course, a politician who has been promoting UK national interest for over decades, she was interested to implement her own policies rather than concentrating in just one issue of Brexit. Unfortunately, this was not popular because all the talks in town was about how and when Brexit will be achieved. And of course, this was contingent on successful negotiation with the European Union. And she could not change domestic political spectrum and was forced to go ahead with the Brexit negotiation, not necessarily fully prepared. And negotiations didn't go very well, uh, either for uh, UK or EU, but it became a political hot potato. In the meantime, the UK unity, UK stands for United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and they say they're composed of four nations, England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Looking from Japan, we tend to believe that UK is a very united one country, but in fact, the history shows, and also the tradition shows, in some corners, even languages are different, and there is animosity from the three others against the dominating England. And as a proof of this, both Scotland and Northern Ireland was in favor of remaining in EU, while England and Wales was in favor of departing from EU. So this is a burning issue that will be with UK for some time to come. Now, Theresa May was not able to have her own Brexit deal approved by the parliament, the Westminster. And then after failing three times, having her own deal approved by the House of Commons, she stepped down and another election for leader of the Conservative Party was held and Boris Johnson became the Prime Minister. He inherited the composition, which is uh, the same as uh, uh, what uh, Theresa May had produced in the election, she lost her majority. And the government under Johnson was not 
a majority government that could control Westminster at its will. Boris Johnson took a bold step of calling another general election and he scored a major victory. The majority is totally dominant and Johnson's government can secure to implement all policies that Johnson will initiate. Two things I'd like to call your attention on. Why didn't Theresa May win while Johnson won in such an overwhelming majority? One, the period during Theresa May's reign, the parliament, because there was no dominant majority and the coalition government was in rule, the parliament was in a state of hung parliament, uh, which means parliament cannot make decisions and disabling the government from implementing its own policies. This was seen as dysfunctional government by the public and the media as well. In UK, policies have to be implemented and government need to be decisive. But because the parliament will object and the government will have to concede and bring compromises for any proposals to be approved by the parliament. It took a long time, much more than is necessary, for people could endure, and it was seen as a political fiasco that will not be effective in ruling UK. Now, Boris Johnson was foreign minister under Theresa May but he had resigned in protest of a Brexit deal that uh, Theresa May had agreed. It's a bit strange, isn't it? He is a foreign minister, and as foreign minister in the cabinet, how could a cabinet approved deal be the reason for his uh, res resignation? There were many of these uh, strange uh, <clears throat> uh, happenings during Theresa May's uh, prime ministership, and this is one. Now, Johnson took over, and uh, he was already uh, starting to promote a very solid and st straightforward rule, which means the prime minister will be dominating the cabinet and making all decisions. This is uh, not the style Theresa May had taken. Uh, when she took prime ministership, she welcomed both what's called the Brexiteers and the Remainers as major members of her own cabinet. Boris Johnson decided to formulate a cabinet that will be totally under his control. That starts with calling a general election and designating candidates that will be directed by Johnson and Johnson only. He was able to disnominate, in other words, take away the Conservative Party's uh, registration as candidate from many of the important cabinet members who were more considerate in a way or undecided looked at look uh, looked by the public in major issues and therefore seen as disrupting progress toward achieving brexit his motto title or message for the election was get brexit done just three words, very simple. It did penetrate through, not just England or Wales, but through the country. And people are, were becoming frustrated that 
after three years, the result of referendum was already there. The exit from UK EU has not even happened. So Boris said, let me do it, get Brexit done. The Labour Party, the opposition, was not as clear in their message vis-à-vis -vis Brexit. Uh, they said, in fact, and it will going to take uh, two or three minutes to explain their position because it was so complicated. They said the, the deal that they currently see is not acceptable. Once they are in the government, they will formulate another deal through negotiation with the EU. And when that deal, that agreement is reached, that agreement will be put to the uh, referendum or the, the opinion polls of the public. And then after that uh, public opinion is made available, the ruling party, uh, which is the Labour Party, they assume, will make decisions on how that will be implemented. Now, that's much too long. Get Brexit done is very very strong message and people understood that better than the verbiage that they saw in the labor policy so the frustration among public for no decisions led to create a major victory for boris johnson who currently continues to enjoy the term of the uh, lower house, the Com House of Commons member uh, in UK is five years. So from December 2019, they have a term that continues till 2024. It's a fairly long term. And Johnson was able to achieve this political stability to push the Brexit agenda. Now, what is now going to happen and what are UK policy toward uh, the rest of the world now that they are out of EU? First, of course, uh, they're out and therefore well, they no longer have to respect or be bound by the consensus uh, uh, mechanism of uh, EU directives or the uh, European Parliament's uh, lawmaking or policies for that matter, and therefore total freedom. They call this, they are now back in functioning sovereign state. At the same time, the economy of UK has relied very heavily on their part in the European Union, uh, almost 50% of the economic prosperity was depending on trading relations, export and import, or investment, this is again in and out, uh, with the continental Europe. That of course may continue to a certain extent, but not as smoothly as it was during the time UK has been member of EU. And therefore, UK on its own has to find new markets which will at least compensate, if not bring more benefits to UK. In the global background, there's another moving agenda which is the central of the globe shifting from Atlantic to the Pacific, Asia, and overall Indo-Pacific. Global Britain is the term that has been used. Theresa May used it. Boris Johnson emphasizes that. And this is now being translated in the integrated review of uh, UK uh, foreign, foreign policies as well as the security policies, which emphasizes the need for UK to look at Indo-Pacific and, in other words, in the larger world beyond Europe. What is the issue here? As I said earlier, 
50% of trade to UK, EU. Hopefully able to maintain that and not to totally diminish that. That is very important because they are neighbors and you cannot replace neighbors. At the same time, the importance of US for UK has drastically increased, which is only logical because they have to uh, rely on larger market as well as politically align with the most influential country in the world, which is US. Fortunately, they have had a tradition of special relationship with the US and that relationship is now improving now that Donald Trump is no longer president. Uh, Joe Biden seems to be more aligned both with the EU or UK in terms of their engagement with global issues, as was confirmed in the joint leader statement issued at the time of Prime Minister Suga's visit to Washington just a day or two ago. UK, of course, has been creating and has been the crafter of the post-war international order and they are continuing to pursue the rule-based international order. UK has its own strength. One is historical and that is permanent membership in the United Nations Security Council. Only five countries have permanent membership. It is also a member of G7 and G20. UK is looking at actively participate in UN, WTO and other multilateral fora now that it can promote its own policies without being restrained or without being in need of coordinating with other EU countries. Focus on Indo-Pacific, as I said, has been more logical than emotional. Uh, it is the center of global economic growth, and it is also an area where there is rising concern of Chinese aggressive policies. It is also an area where US finds its presence to be in question sometimes and in need for reinforcement. So political militarily, the UK's attention to Indo-Pacific aligns with US interests as well as Japanese interest. The global challenges that we see in today's world is becoming more and more conspicuous and then threatening to the stability. I'm not going to uh, go into detail. Uh, I'd like to keep time for Q&A. Russia and China and others are challenging the existing global order. Um, we could uh, spend hours discussing this. Uh, COVID-19, as we are currently experiencing, is not going to go away very easily. It will be with us for some time, may not even be uh, away for a very long time. Now, UK, of course, is uh, well aware it is not a superpower. It needs to coordinate with other countries to cope with its challenges. One, the traditional friends, the Commonwealth countries. These are countries that uh, UK wishes to have better coordination of policy or better identification of common interests. At the same time, democracies, rule of law, respect for human rights, important values that need to be promoted further to realize and strengthen global stability and prosperity continues to be at center stage of UK approach to the world. So they're calling for democracies to coordinate and work together. 
that leads, of course, to, again, a logical conclusion of strengthening ties with Japan. <clears throat> Foreign Minister Motegi uh, chose UK as the first destination of his visit during the pandemic. This was symbolic, and of course it was not easy for UK to accept, nor for the Foreign Minister to travel, but it was a very important visit to lay the basis for the new Suga administration of choosing countries that share values with Japan in promoting Japanese diplomacy. Again, uh, I will not uh, cite the uh, joint document agreed between UK and Japan, including document that uh, was released after the defense and foreign ministers uh, so-called two plus two meeting, which was conducted online, that emphasizes the need to promote further the rule-based international order. After uh, Motegi's visit, the first uh, FTA that uh, UK was able to conclude was with Japan. And of course, uh, the basic values of democracy, human rights and rule of law have been confirmed. And UK has voluntarily uh, supported the free and open Indo-Pacific. These are uh, quite positive signs of global Britain, which, if successful, could lead to bring UK back to a leading position in the world. Now, what is UK's strength? One symptom that we see is the rapid success we see in having their population vaccinated. It has suffered very severely from damages caused by the pandemic and at one time was the worst in Europe. And now there seems to be, hopefully, moving out from the worst stages and perhaps back or closing uh, closer to, uh, back to economic activities as usual. And these are done by economic and technological strength of the uh, UK. The UK uh, Integrated uh, Policy Review on Diplomacy puts as a first item of uh, uh, UK strength, UK's high tech and science and technology which I believe is a very correct uh, self-understanding. Uh, and we need to, we in Japan need to appreciate that. Japan, unfortunately, uh, has a long way to go to match the vaccination rate UK currently has achieved. These are all based on basic science investment that needs to be done decades ahead of crisis. UK has continued to invest both publicly and privately to high level education and they have global top 10 universities and when it comes to medical science they are indeed one of the strong, strongest country in the world. That also translates it into the IT and other advanced technologies that will become very critical for global economic growth, if not already. In other words, although they are no superpower, the technology and the intellectual strength that they have achieved will continue to allow UK to play a major role in global affairs. And it is a country that we should not ignore, of course, but try to work together for 
global good. Now, before I close, just one word on CPTPP or TPP 11. I did not prepare a <coughs> uh, slide for that because, again, if I do, it will be at least one more hour. But just one word. UK has uh, applied for accession to CPTPP. It's important to be very precise on the use of the words to describe what UK is doing. UK has applied for accession to TPP 11. It is not proposing negotiation to enter TPP 11 because TPP 11 is not negotiable. Well, when one country is applying for UN membership, it does not negotiate UN Charter. It has to accept the standing norms and then by accepting that and then having approved both from the membership, it will be allowed to become a member. The same is true of the TPP 11. There is, however, one group of issues that can be negotiated, and those are specific trade barriers, including tariffs. So there is room for negotiation of tariff, provided that eventually all tariffs will go to zero. Japan itself, during the TPP negotiation, had not been able to remove all tariffs because of uh, concern in uh, domestic politics. But there will be more negotiations in the future as, C as TPP is designed to grow. And that will be the time when further tariff reduction may be negotiated. But the rules such as protection of intellectual property, the liberalization of e-commerce, the uh, implementation of uh, protection for labor rights as well as environmental concern. These are rules that one cannot negotiate. Any member, any country that wishes to become a member has to accept those, including procedure for dispute settlement, which includes industry state dispute settlement mechanism called ISDS which is not included in Japan-UK Economic Partnership Agreement, which has entered into effect. And it will be for TPP accession process that uh, UK hopefully will accept. Uh, let me stop here and then uh, uh, enter into Q&A. Uh, and I'm looking very much forward to having uh, dialogue or discussion with uh, the audience. Thank you all very much for your attention. Back to you, uh, Professor Mitishita. Thank you very much, Ambassador Tiroka, uh, for the presentation.